Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Beyond Traffic podcast. I'm your host, Abdelgeni Shehu. Today, Craig Hewitt is joining me on the show. Craig is the founder and CEO of Castos, a podcast hosting platform that helps tens of thousands of podcasters realize their dream of sharing their voice with the world through audio. He's also the co-host of Rogue Startups, a podcast with 200 plus episodes where he and Dave Rodenborg share the lessons learned and pitfalls to avoid along the way to growing a bootstrapped startup. In the last six years of running Castors, he's grown the company to over 4,000 customers and their blog is one of the highest traffic blog on podcasting in the industry. So welcome once again to the show, Craig. I'm excited to be chatting with you today about um, SEO for Castors and how you approach it over there. Just before we proceed, I guess this short introduction does justice to what you've done so far and your background. First of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and, and hope that, that I can share some stuff that's helpful for kind of you and your audience, but thank you for the kind words in the introduction. And it's great to be here. This is my favorite topic. I think, you know, content marketing and SEO are things that we've invested in for a very long time and uh, happy to share our experiences and kind of help however we can. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Before we dive in, I would like to know your background and specifically I'm interested in knowing how you got into SEO. Yeah. So my background prior to starting Castos, we, we ran a productized service called podcast motor, and we've since kind of folded that into the Castos umbrella to where they're all running in the same company at this point. But that was my, my first successful online business venture and, and like really didn't know how to do anything except for blogging and learned that like, that's actually called content marketing and that you can do better with content marketing by this thing called SEO, but really just like kind of got into it because it was something I could do. I was totally bootstrapped. I didn't know what AdWords were. I didn't know any of that stuff, So, but I knew how to podcast and I knew that I should probably have a blog for for our site because that's just what everyone else did. And, you know, turns out that like the compounding effects of content marketing SEO over like eight years that we've been doing it are really strong. And I think that we see a lot of new companies saying like, we're just not going to invest in this because it takes too long to pay off and blah, blah, blah. And I just say like, man, just start, like do something today. And in six months, you'll be thankful that you did because then when you realize that you really want to get serious about it, you have this kind of library of content and kind of weight in Google that you can build upon. But if you don't do any blogging or any content marketing, and those two things are not the same, right? Maybe we can talk about the difference between blogging and content marketing. If you do something to begin with, and even before you launch your product, maybe then, then when it's time to get really serious about content and SEO, you have this kind of good starting point to launch from. Wow. That, that's amazing. So you actually started Castors from the agency that you were running previously, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yep. Okay. So why did you pivot from running an agency to starting a software business? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, it's like a lot of people like you, you start with an agency or, or your know, productized services, what I like to call it. And you have this dream of like, oh, if I ran a software company, like we'd be able to scale up amazingly and it'd be mega profitable mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. And, yeah. and like <laughs> some of that is true, but the hurdle to get over in a technology or a product company is so big, especially in SaaS, where you're continuing to reinvest in technology and support and QA and infrastructure and all these kinds of things to, to where like, I think scale really is only achievable after like a a certain point that's quite a bit higher and further than a lot of us think. So, so if you have, you know, 10 or $20,000 a month of recurring revenue, you're kind of just barely making it, I think for, for most SaaS companies, whereas like a product as service, you could be the one fulfilling the service doing 10 or 20,000 a month. And that's a really great kind of lifestyle business. So I think it's one is not right or wrong. It's just different depending on kind of your goals and your goals for, for kind of your life and, and the company. Well, that's really interesting. So I think I've said with a lot of agency owners and like, it's, it's always a dream of an agency owner to own a software company. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So another question I have for you is I, I want you to talk to me about castors. So assuming someone 
in the audience is listening to this episode of the podcast and they don't know about Castor. So what does Castor does? What are its core features? Who will find it most helpful and, and any yeah. other thing you'd like to share? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so Castos is a podcast hosting and analytics platform. So for a show like this, you need a place to, to host and, and publish it. And, and that's what, that's what we do. We create an RSS feed and that's the connection between your podcast and directories like Apple podcasts, Spotify, and then actually people's phones use an RSS feed kind of based technology to, to download episodes and find out about new podcasts. So we're really that home base for, for tens of thousands of podcasts. We give a bunch of analytics around who's listening, where to what episodes, how those perform over time and things like that. And I think the place where we really stand apart from most all the rest of the competition is we have quite a bit of technology around repurposing content into different formats. And so I always like to say podcasting is so special because like we'll sit and talk here for an hour or 45 minutes, and then you can turn this into, you know, a video for YouTube, an audio podcast, a blog post. You can transcribe it, which is like a seriously long <laughs> blog post. You can create audiograms or short video clips for YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and all of that for 45 minutes of work and then paying someone to, to kind of help repurpose that content. And we, as a technology company, do a lot of work around repurposing content into different formats. So we have technology to convert audio to video, published YouTube, automatic transcriptions and ability to create audiograms. So these kind of short video clips of, of episodes. So I think we're one of the only ones in the industry that kind of offer all of that. And uh, for folks who are really serious about like growing their podcast by getting it in front of different audiences and different platforms, it's, it's a no brainer. Wow. That's amazing. So like Castos is not just a podcast hosting platform. So it's also good for repurposing your podcast into other channels and platforms, yep. right? Exactly. Yep. So let, let, let's dive in into why we are having this. For someone like me, when I'm searching for something related to podcasting and I do that, in most cases, I do find casters ranking high on Google. So, and that makes me think like, okay, this company is actually investing heavily in SEO. So I want mm. to know why did you decide to go all in with SEO at casters? Yeah, I think that one of my mentors, a guy named Rob Walling has, has talked a lot about this, that like in the, in the kind of overall playbook of customer acquisition strategies for SaaS companies, it's a little bit restricted by kind of average price, right? So if you're an enterprise company charging $2,000 a month, you can do things like outbound email and cold calling and go to conventions and all this kind of stuff. But if you're a, a company like ours, that's mostly like self-serve, lower price point, higher volume, you can't do stuff like that. You know, even paid acquisition for the most part is kind of outside of the realm of what we can do. So it really limits the scope of ways you can acquire customers. Content marketing and SEO is one, affiliates and partnerships is one, and word of mouth obviously is one and then like virality, maybe another one. Our product is not one that really has a viral component to it, like Calendly or a Dropbox or something like that. So that really leaves like affiliates and partnerships, which we do a bit of, and then content marketing and SEO. And we really like that because we can be like complete control of that as a channel, right? We're still like, it's up to Google how we ultimately do, but like, I think if we do a good enough job, we'll be rewarded with kind of high rankings and traffic and customers as a result. But, but it was partly due to kind of the economics of the business model is like we have plans starting at $19, you know, at that point, you just can't operate successfully certain customer acquisition strategies and content marketing and SEO were definitely ones that scale for the type of business we have. We also had kind of a head start there, right? Cause we'd been doing it for a while already. And so to kind of double down on it made a lot of sense. Yeah. And to your point about like, you see us everywhere, th this is something that the folks at HubSpot talk a lot about and they call it surround. If you're HubSpot, as an example, if you're going to buy a CRM system, you're going to be doing a bunch of research on. CRMs and cold calling and email and automation, all this kind of stuff. And you'll find, and you'll see HubSpot in every one of those search results, right? And so subconsciously you say to yourself, wow, these people must really know what they're talking about. If Google, like, well, up until now with chat GPT, at least like a, <laughs> a tool that I place a lot of trust in to give me the right answers, recommends their resources at almost every turn when I'm looking at something around this core topic of, of a CRM and kind of sales enablement. Wow. HubSpot must really know what they're talking about. And we take the same approach, right? If, if you're searching for podcast equipment and podcast formats and how to generate a good name for your podcast or best podcast hosting or whatever, and you see us on every one of those, you know, Google search results, you, you probably say to yourself, at least subconsciously, like, wow, like I just see these folks everywhere. Like there must be something to this. So that's kind of some of the theory of 
how we approach it and why we think it's successful on, on like a meta level, because that's something you talked about at the beginning. Well, that's really amazing. I think that approach has helped pastors um, over the years. Another question I have is like most founders do have this kind of pushback when you talk to them about it. So from your own perspective as a founder, when will you say is the best time to invest in SEO as a startup? Day zero. Yeah. Yeah. So like if I was going to start a new company today, I would map out a bunch of content, hire a writer and get six months of a plan and start publishing content at least once a week. Let's say I wanted to start a product around, I don't know, biohacking, right? I, I would just start publishing content. I would figure out the opportunities for us to rank pretty quickly. So don't go after the big, huge, meaty, super hard to rank for a term, but go after some of the long tail stuff at, at the beginning, just to see some initial traction in, in rankings and then build that up over time and then start going after the big, difficult to rank for terms later on. Wow, that's impressive. So because a lot of founders have this idea about, even though like, I, I think it is quite from what some marketers advocate that before you invest in SEO, you need to have product market fit, you need to build your brand and all those things. So do you think any of those really matter at all based on your own experience? So like, I think the important thing is like, there's not one single right answer, right? Like I, I'll never forget. I was at a conference called SAS Doc in Dublin a few years ago before the pandemic and, and no joke, three talks in a row by three very different, but very successful companies all said, we achieved our growth by content marketing and by referrals and affiliates and by paid acquisition. And I think another one even was like outreach. And they're all companies that you know, right? So there's not like one right answer. I think that what I was talking about a little bit before with like the, the economics of it might, might be the only thing that cuts off certain opportunities. So like if you're a $10 a month thing, you can't be doing sales calls. It just doesn't work from a numbers perspective. But um, I think content marketing and SEO can be the answer for every company right? Because it's, it's universal, right? I think referrals and affiliates and some paid acquisition can be the right answer for a lot of companies. Yeah. But, but I think that content marketing and SEO is never the wrong answer, but it's not the only answer, I guess. I really appreciate your thoughts. So content marketing is never the right answer for all companies. And it's also never the wrong answer. So it depends on the type of company that you run and the stage that you are, your competition, the industry that you are in as well. So I think that will most likely play a role in how fast you go ahead with investing in SEO or how you decide to slow down things a bit. Um, I would like us to change gears a bit and talk about your SEO playbook. So what was your approach like in the early days of doing SEO for customers? It was terrible. So, so early on it was, Hey, what do I think we should write about? And I write about it or we brought on a writer soon after and we write about it and that was it. And there was no intentionality or strategy around it. And then I started working with a guy named Pavel from Smashing Copy who does like keyword research and kind of SEO and planning. And that's great because, because he is able to give like a really concise kind of plan of, so, okay, in this quarter, we need to write these 12 articles, but we need to improve these two or three. And we really got intentional about like our, our SEO strategy from like a proactive, like new content we're writing, but also then like, Hey, lean to prune these articles. We need to combine these because they're competitive and they're like cannibalizing the results of another article on the site. So I think that like, whether it's you taking a course like the blogging for business course from hrefs or just kind of learning on your own or or hiring a consultant that that does this for you get some strategy around what should we do so we don't go waste a bunch of time like <laughs> you know researching all this stuff and or, or just like writing all these articles that that don't really have any intents that that customers would want because i think that's like the challenge is like you can write a bunch of articles and rank for really top of funnel low buyer intent keywords and the kind of commercial value of those efforts is really low, as opposed to writing a really super bottom of the funnel, high converting blog post, you'll see the results so much quicker there. Of course, typically those are harder to rank for typically, but, but not always, but I think that's like something I didn't know even up to a few years ago. And I think is a really important thing is like, we say every blog post has a job. Some of those times it's to get customers. Some of it's to, to try to be viral and get rank, get links. And some of it's just to be shared. There's a lot of different jobs that a blog post can have or a piece of content, I should say, because, because everything's not a blog post and you just have to be really intentional about like, 
decide what that piece of content is, what its job is. And then kind of from there, the structure of the content is a lot more clear. Well, I really appreciate you for sharing your thoughts about being strategic with SEO and also mentioning the high volume, low intent versus low volume, high intent strategy towards SEO. So I, I would like you to dive deep regarding that. You mentioned that when you started, you were just writing different articles that comes to mind before you hired someone and eventually along the line, you learned about the strategy of focusing on keywords that might have low volume, but it has a high commercial intent. Can you dive deep into some specific examples of how your strategy changed from targeting top of the funnel keywords to the bottom of the funnel and the middle of the funnel keywords for customers? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'll use an example of like maybe email marketing because just everyone knows it and it applies to everyone. So if you are convert kit, right? Everyone, I think those convert kit, big email marketing automation software, they, they have topics they want to rank for that are really bottom of the funnel, like email marketing automation or email nurture campaign or how to write good email sequences or something like that. Right? Like things that if I'm in a business and I want to do a thing and achieve a business objective, that's the kind of stuff I would be researching. I am in the market to solve a problem. And I think technology can solve that problem for me. And maybe even this exact tool that I'm on the site reading this blog post about is the thing that can help me. I'll mention Ahrefs again, like they're the absolute best at this, right? They actually had a video a couple weeks ago that was like product led marketing, I think product led content, right? So like them using content to show how their tool solves a problem, right? So, so it's a little bit of an aside, but it's the absolute best example of really bottom of the funnel stuff because they are solving a problem using their tool and showing how it's done right it's like absolutely the best but back to the email example like terms where people who are have a problem and are looking for a solution write a piece of content about it and ideally how your product solves that problem for them as opposed to something more top of the funnel be like 80 newsletters you should subscribe to around self-help Right. It's really general. It has very low intent because very few of the people that sign up on that are actually going to be people that write emails, but are more consumers of it. For us, an example might be best true crime podcasts, right? Like a bunch of people like true crime, they land on that blog post and they go out to subscribe to true crime podcasts. Almost nobody becomes a customer of Castos and creates their own podcast. Whereas a blog post for us would be like best podcast equipment or how to start your podcast on Spotify. Those are people that are in the market to use our product to solve into, you know, a problem that they have. I really appreciate you for sharing those insights. I think this is something that a lot of founders are struggling with. Most people think that SEO is just a traffic acquisition channel. They don't look at SEO as a customer acquisition channel. So they just want to acquire more traffic using SEO. And they are not actually thinking about how they can acquire customers, how they can grow their business using SEO. I think the approach of ensuring that the content that you are writing on your website, maybe on your blog, it could be on your YouTube channel, like ensuring that the content has a job for your business. I think that, that solves that to a large extent. Another question I have here is I, I would like to know, so you have invested in SEO for customers, uh, what are some specific business results that you've been able to achieve through your SEO efforts? Yeah, I think one that is worth mentioning is, is not around blogging, but is around tools. So sure. I'll use HubSpot again, because they're so good at this, right? Ahrefs is too, and there's a couple others that are, that are really good at this, but like content marketing is not only blogging, right? It can be podcasting. It can be your YouTube channel, can be like an email newsletter, and it can be things like free tools. So we launched a, a kind of set of free tools a while back. So if you want to check it out, just go to castles.com slash tools. And it's things like, like a podcast name generator, a way to create podcast cover art without signing up for Canva or using Photoshop or something like that, a way to look up your RSS feed or a podcast RSS feed if, if you need to. And we're going to be building on our tool set there, but this is a way again, to like solve problems that people are having. That is not like a long form written piece of content, but like an interactive piece of technology or tool entirely free. And the goal of it is, is to just surround the set of problems and kind of concerns that your potential customers have in different ways. And so it's been great. I mean, we've, we get quite a bit more traffic 
with our set of tools and are ranking like quite high for some of them. And they're pretty new and, and we've not done a ton to like build links to them or anything. So it's been a cool way to diversify our content strategy a little bit to go like outside of blogging. Everything's on our site and is a really cool set of tools, like resources for podcasters. You know, sometimes I think like blog posts and YouTube videos and stuff like that are great, but like, it's not always the right answer. You know, the format should be different depending on like the problem you're trying to solve. I think building free tools is an SEO strategy that a lot of startups or SaaS companies under it. So I would like to know, how did you discover this strategy? If you could share more details about, okay, like this was how you decided to create a free tool for podcast name generator. So like, what was the process like, and how did you figure out that that is a good opportunity to go after? Yeah, I mean, it's something I've always been kind of aware of, I guess, and just never took the time. Like, I'm not a developer, so like, I have a hard time actually building these things. So it was a bit of like, hey, instead of us investing in our core product, we need to divert some of our developer and product resources into this. So that was a bit of a, a business decision is to like pull technical talent off of like building product into building marketing tools. But it's always been kind of a thing that I've been aware of. And then it was just a strategic decision for us to say like, Hey, we're going to invest in this. And it's kind of like, as I talked about at the very beginning with like, Hey, just start podcasting. Like we have a set of three tools right now. We have a couple more in mind and for us to like build those additional tools, add them on link to them on the page, enter a link between the tools. All is very easy, but glad to get that out there, let it sit, let it marinate for six months or something like that. And then to go back and add more tools to it, I think should have a, a bigger effect, should get more traction quicker because the, the groundwork and the infrastructure for those tools is already laid. And then adding more tools on top of it is, is pretty easy. I think the people that do this the best are Veed. It's a video editing tool. They went big into tools and yeah, if you just look at some of the the traffic that, that's out there on them. It, it's a huge part of their content strategy. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning V there. So I, I also did a case study piece about V.io SEO strategy. So anyone interested, like you can Google V.io SEO strategy, you'll see like where I, I did an in-depth tear down of how Vid is actually using free tools to dominate their industry. Another question that I would like you to answer as far as free tools are concerned is like some founders that I've spoken to have this concern about, okay, you already have your main tool and you want to build a free tool and you know, like this will cost, um, time and resources in terms of development and all this. So do you think it is kind of a wise investment? Like building a free tool when you already have a paid tool that you offer to your users, when you can actually make that free tool paid. Yeah. There's a couple of things I hear. I think one, like free tools all help customers achieve the objective of like being a successful customer for us. Right. So like our free tools are a part of our paid product oftentimes, and then we just okay. abstract them away and offer them as a free tool. So say your V.io, you could have like a free clipping tool. Right. It's just this thing that clips the beginning in, but, but that's also part of their video editing tool. Right. It's the same for us with like the cover image generator. We call it dynamo. Like every podcast needs a cover image, right. And a place that we knew a lot of people get hung up is like, how do I create this cover image? I'm not a graphic designer. So we built just a super, super simple version of Canva basically that like, it's always the right dimensions. It's always the right file type. Uh, you can overlay some text, have gradients, background, and things like that to, to where like anyone who's not a designer can go do this like really easily. So like one, it solves customer problems and, and overcomes barriers to them being successful and converting to being customers Two, like the technology is like maybe already there in the product and you just abstract it away to being a free tool, or we've kind of done this both ways or like offered as a free tool. And then if traction really comes either just link to it from the product, which is what we're doing now, or just like build it into the product later. So I think that like that interchangeability should always be part of it. And then I think like. The, the other part of it is like, especially for technical founders, writing blog content is really daunting. And so they may want to say, Hey, instead of me schlepping for two months to write eight new blog posts, I'm just going to take two months and build a free tool. And that free tool will like persistently consistently, whatever forever, like be a traffic and value generator for my business. So I think that it's just different. I don't think it's right or wrong. I think it maybe depends on the founder and the team and, and kind of like your goals there for us, it was a bit, we reached this kind of local inflection point of like, 
we've written about most of the real bottom of the funnel content that we want to write about. And so now we want to broaden the scope of our digital footprint to include the tools realm. And so we did that. Now we're going back to write more top of the funnel content. So I think that could be it too, is like, where are you in your SEO journey? Have you kind of checked the boxes of a lot of the really important, like middle and bottom of funnel terms, then maybe layering on something like tools, a YouTube channel, something like that could be the way to go. Well, wow. thanks for sharing that. My takeaway is that when it comes to building a free tool, one of the things that make it to actually work is the free tool should be related to your paid tool. So you mm -hmm. shouldn't build a free tool that doesn't have any relation to your paid tool, except maybe you just want to build it for the sake of acquiring backlinks and on. And then secondly, you could actually take a part of your paid tool and make it a free tool. So you can even restrict access to some users. So when they want to do more things, you just up upsell them that, okay, if you want to do this, you can sign up for a paid tool. So that, that could also be a way. I think AHS does that with their, their backlink checker, their website checker. So if you, even if you use it, like what you can see is actually limited until you sign up for the paid yep. tool, but they're actually offering you value that you see that, wow, so this is what I can gain if I am actually a user of this tool. So I really appreciate you for sharing those insights. I want us to change here a bit. I'm a subscriber to your newsletter, Founder Insights. And then one of the things you recently shared is about now marketing teams for startups. So I would like you to share more about how as using that approach helped you with your startups SEO. Yeah, I think that the, the kind of backstory from the article is like, we've had several full-time marketing folks on our team and, and they're great, right? But the thing that you pretty quickly realize is that no single person can do everything really well. So instead of, and I'll just use round numbers just to make the math easy, because it's hard to do math on a podcast. Instead of paying someone say $10,000 a month, uh, to do everything that you want marketing, you know, done in your company, could you pay four different people, $2,500 a month? to do one for content, one for like SEO strategy, like on and off site, one for like conversion rate optimization maybe. And then one person that's like a marketing manager that does things like email and kind of ties all, all this back together. And, and it's the strategy we're going with right now, cause we've done both. And that like a single person is not a subject matter expert in anything really as deeply as a person who only focuses on this one specific thing. I think it only works when either you as the founder have kind of a good marketing mind to where you can put all these pieces together and have a good strategy around it, or you, you need to pay someone to, to do that. And that's what, what I would call like a marketing manager. They're the coordinator. They're the glue that brings content and SEO and paid and CRO all together. But that's really the premise is like a lot of us get frustrated by marketing and marketing hires because like you, you, you think you need this one person that will like magically solve all your problems. And, and that's probably not ever going to happen. And so instead maybe just like admit that upfront and say, okay, I'm not going to go look for this unicorn person, but instead I'm going to hire for this one specific problem. And then I'm going to hire for this other specific problem. And, and it especially works if you haven't proven these channels, right? So if you're like, Hey, I want to go after TikTok." um, Hiring a full-time person to test a channel is a bad idea. Instead, hire a consultant to where they come in, they know how to build the system and report on it and evaluate it. And then if it works great, and if it doesn't, like the relationship you have with them is such that like, you can say, Hey, I'm sorry, this is not working out. And it's just less of an obligation and engagement for you and for them, right? It's just, you know, working with a contractor consultant that like, this is, this is for a period of time probably. And that can be years, right? But, but it, it has that kind of built in. I really appreciate you for sharing that. When I read the, the newsletter, like I, I was thinking this could actually solve the problem that a lot of founders who are technical founders, but have no background in marketing have with marketing. So instead of maybe hiring someone full time to work with you, you could hire freelancers, consultants, agencies to actually do specific tasks for you and depending on what you want to achieve for your business. So still on that. So when it comes to how you approach it as customer, you have a fractional marketer who does for you or like, how do you do that? Yeah. We have an SEO consultant that we work with and their job is to do kind of 
keyword research and strategy on the content that we write, but then also kind of monitoring and optimizing for our current rankings for the kind of dozens of keywords that we want to rank for. So they're kind of always looking forward at new stuff and then, you know, present, like, how are we ranking for things and what, what should we be doing, you know, on site and off site to boost those rankings of the piece that we already have. So one final question I have is like, let's say a SaaS founder is just starting with SEO. So, and they want to make a business impact with their efforts. What would be your advice to them? Yeah, I think that the biggest thing is, is focusing on bottom of the funnel, high buyer intent content first. So writing content for people who are looking to solve a problem is going to show the biggest kind of business objective first. And I think the other thing that we haven't talked about, but like there is a strategy where you can run retargeting ads to people who visited that bottom of the funnel content. So maybe retargeting doesn't work for, or maybe driving cold traffic to your site doesn't work from, from AdWords, but retargeting people who visited certain blog posts could be a strategy to bring them back into your world. I think it just kind of talks to the surround sound strategy a little bit, but then kind of diversifies it out into, into paid acquisition. So using free content as a first touch point, uh, and then showing ads to people who visited some of that high buyer intent content is probably the, the simplest strategy for people who are looking to get started. Okay. That's amazing. So free content plus retargeting ads. So, but when it comes to retargeting, like, where do you prefer to do that? Or like which platform Google works best AdWords. for you? Okay, Google Ads. With that, we've come to the end of our interview and I really appreciate you for the insights that you've shared. I, I gained a lot, especially as far as startup marketing is concerned, because a lot of founders find it difficult to see how they could do SEO with what they are doing. I think the insights you've shared will help them to see how, even if you are a startup founder, you could still do SEO, you could do content marketing and you get results for your business. So before we go, is there anything else you'd like our audience to know about you? Like maybe if they want to connect with you, how can they find and get in touch with you? Yeah, for sure. So I mean, I think if you're looking for kind of what we do at Castos in terms of content, just castos.com, C-A-S-T-O-S.com. And you can find me, you can find me probably easiest is my website, craighewitt.me. And I'm on Twitter at the Craig Hewitt and DMs are always open. So love to chat with everyone. Okay. Thank you very much, Craig. I really appreciate you for your time, for sharing the insights with me today on how startups can do SEO right and get the best results for, for their business. I really appreciate you for your time. Thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me.